Hey guys, what's going on? I hope you're having an awesome day. Today, it's gonna to be a very informal video. We're just going to be going through and analyzing all of the businesses that we put in our shortlist. So if you haven't seen last week's episode, episode three, we basically went through and we picked out a bunch of businesses from industries that we thought were interesting and we also used stock screeners to find a bunch of businesses that may or may not fit our criteria. We shortlisted them and now we're gonna go through and analyze them. So a lot of this is just going to be on my computer for today. So without further ado, let's just jump over to my computer. All right, so here we've got the shortlist of all the stocks that we are going to be looking into, the ones that we found from last week's episode. And just below that, I've got a checklist, which is the four things that almost all of the greatest investors in the world um, follow, the checklist that they follow somewhat, in, you know, in some form or another. They look for meaning, it has to be within their circle of competence, they need to be able to understand how the business operates at the chorus level. Then you need uh, a moat, a long-term competitive advantage in a qualitative and quantitative uh, aspect and I'll explain what I mean by that when we get to it. Then we need management that has skill and integrity and we're looking at how they manage their capital and how they manage their debt, again I'll explain that and lastly we're looking for companies valued with a margin of safety, so priced at 50% of their fair value. And we might not get to the margin of safety in this video, I may focus on the first three and sort of find which businesses we think are really solid businesses because really it's two parts. Really it's like this, the first three we've got are looking at whether or not, well the first one is whether or not we're going to be able to understand the business, the second two are whether or not it's a good business, whether or not it's a great business that's going to be successful over the long term. And then this bit, the margin of safety is all about the price. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good the business is, if we're not buying it at the right price, then it's it's a waste of money because we the price determines what return we're going to get, the price and the performance of the stocks. They're both equally important. So we will be focusing on that as well. And because I'm doing this for a series, I do want to be a little bit less conservative than I would be in real life because in, in reality, I'm looking to only invest in a new company maybe like once a year, maybe twice a year, maybe even less than that. Um, but of course, for this series, I want to be investing more than that because it'll make it a little bit more exciting if we're adding more stocks to the portfolio and it makes it a little bit more practical for you guys uh, if we're adding more stocks to the, to the portfolio. So the first bit, circle of competence, I'm probably going to not be as strict as I would be in real life on that aspect because I, if we find a really great business and it's at a decent price, I don't want to just be like, no, nah, I don't understand the business well enough, so we're not going to invest in it for the portfolio series. So I'm going to be a little bit less strict on that, but just be aware that uh, in reality, I would be very, very strict on all three of these, on all four of them actually, and I'm only looking to invest maybe once or twice a year, if that. So the first thing I'm actually going to do is we're gonna start off with the moat. We're gonna see if there's some kind of long-term competitive advantage that we can see uh, in each of these companies in a qualitative sense and in a quantitative sense. So what I mean by that is first I'm looking for qualitative, which means I'm looking for something, some sort of quality about the business that I think or that I can hypothesize has, or gives it some sort of long-term competitive advantage. So for example, a qualitative moat might be its strong brand, for example, I know General Motors has a very, very powerful brand in the auto, automotive uh, industry. Coca-Cola has a Coca-Cola and Pepsi actually, both of them have very powerful brands. Uh, you could argue that Coca-Cola has been able to market that uh, better. Um, Apple's uh, switching brand, their ecosystem, I spoke about that in my Apple video that I released earlier this week um, and how that once you're trapped into, or not trapped, but once you have a number of Apple products, it's kind of annoying to switch because it's just so convenient that everything works together. Your phone works with your laptop and your Apple TV and all of it works nicely together. That's called a switching moat. So that's what I would call a qualitative uh, moat. And that's basically, I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing. I'm just saying, I'm looking at the company and I, I, I think that I can see a moat there. Then we need that to be backed up in a quantitative sense. We need to see it backed up in the fundamental numbers and we're looking at those four key areas. We're looking at the sales, the earnings per share, the equity and the free cash flow and if we see those are growing consistently over time, it indicates to us that competition isn't able 
to compete with them because they're able to get stronger and stronger each and every year in that market. It shows that they're fending off competition fairly easily or they're doing a very good job at it at least. So every single one on this list, except for maybe stamps.com, clearly has a qualitative brand moat. They're all brands that we recognize and they have that behind them to give them a little bit of reputability that we, we, you would be comfortable buying an Apple product. You would be comfortable buying Coca-Cola or Pepsi or getting a game from Activision Blizzard because you know the standard that they're operating at, the level that they're operating at. Google goes a little bit deeper. Google has, and actually maybe Shopify as well has this, um, the industry standard mode, which means that it's just the go-to when you're, you're doing whatever you're doing. It's the go-to product or service. So for example, Google has this in a number of ways. They're the go-to Google, go, go-to, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just said it just then. They're the go-to search engine. And they're, so, they're such the industry standard that you just say, Google search it, or you're gonna Google it. it <laughs> like I, I, I just accidentally said Google search instead of internet search because it's just such an industry standard it's an industry standard for video content with YouTube, um, the platform that you're watching this on. It's the industry standard for smartphone operating systems that aren't Apple smartphones. They, their Android operating system is used almost on every single other smartphone that's created by any brand. And Shopify, you can think of Shopify in that sense as well, um, that if you're making an e-commerce site, it is one of the industry standards. It's one of the go-to websites that are really easy to use and integrate and sort of build out an e-commerce store really quickly. And I think that kind of brand mode applies for Ford and General Motors. They're both very reputable uh, car manufacturers. Both of those hotel chains there, I'm sure, are very reputable hotel chains because they're the biggest in their market. So you can see that what we can do a qualitative analysis, but it's really just hypothesizing and it doesn't really mean a whole lot if it's not backed up in the numbers. That's where the, re that's where the important stuff happens when we're talking about a moat. We can hypothesize all we want. You can say Apple's the greatest company ever, how good's their branding, but if their, their company is performing terribly, then it doesn't mean anything because it's not being realized in the real world, in what matters to us as shareholders, which is a strong, consistently growing business in the fundamentals. All right, so we're just gonna go through and type in and put it, and enter in some of these numbers and see if we can see that the, there's some sort of moat there that's allowing them to rise above their competition. And essentially, you can do this at home as well. The spreadsheet is linked down in the description below and it'll take you to Messenger. You click the yes once, I'll send you a message and you click yes, it'll open it up and you just make a copy of that version because you won't be able to edit the version that opens up for you. You'll just copy it and then uh, you'll be able to edit it and that's what I'm gonna do for this. So I'll just make a few copies of this and essentially we're just gonna start off with General Motors and we don't actually have to enter in, in anything yet. We can just come over to QuickFS is a really good website um, a subscriber showed this to me actually, that allows you to see 10 years of data for all the US stocks, or most of them at least. So we can come over here and let's go over to the income statement to see if this will, I'll just log in. Yeah, so if we come over to the income statement, um, we can have a look and see if this is going to be a business that we're going to want to invest in. So straight away, we're looking at revenue. So the, the four areas we're going to be looking at, as you can see, is sales or revenue, earnings per share, equity, and free cash flow. And we're essentially looking for these to be growing over time. So for General Motors, you can see from 2008, they did um, 150 billion in revenue. And in 2017, they did 145 billion. So their revenue hasn't been growing. I straight away know this isn't a business that I'm, we're not going to be interested in. So I'm just gonna cross them off. I'll just delete them as soon as I realize I'm not interested in them. We'll go to Ford. So we can have a look, revenue. Okay, so revenue for Ford has been growing over time. That's a good sign. So we'll just go over to the income statement and see if the earnings per share has been growing over time. So first of all, we've got some negative numbers, but that was during the recession. So that's not, I'm not too concerned about that. There's growing numbers here, which is quite, quite good, although it is 
a little bit all over the place. I don't like to see that. I don't like to see it all over the place, but that looks like it was a big, so kind of like a one-off, big, um, big earnings. I wonder why that was. They didn't do much greater revenue. Where is it? Ah, oh, they had an income tax deferral, it looks like. Yeah, so it was a one-off. Okay, that's that's okay. So Ford's not looking too bad so far. Let's have a look at the balance sheet for that equity. So if you don't know what equity is, equity is just the uh, assets of a company minus its liabilities. So it's basically the proportion of the company that's funded by its shareholders, really. So we can see that equity was negative for a couple of years here, but it's been getting better. Um, so that's okay. It's not too bad. I don't like to see negative, but um, I'm going to be a little bit less strict for this series. Okay, so for cash flow statement, if you go into key ratios, we're looking at free cash flow. Actually, I'll just explain that. So we're looking for free cash flow, which isn't actually on the cash flow statement, but you get it from numbers on the cash flow statement. So free cash flow really, basically what it means is, it means how much cash is left over or how much cash is coming in or leaving after we've paid for everything that is um, directly relevant to the operations of the business, keeping the business running. And essentially there's cash from operations, that's gonna be almost your free cash flow, and then you're going to be minusing the property plant and equipment, or this is also sometimes called um, capital expenditure. So essentially what that means is you're taking the cash from operations, and then you're minusing how much it costs to maintain your your property, your plant and your equipment, your, your your machinery and that sort of thing. How much is it costing to maintain that sort of stuff? So after you've taken that away, you get what's called free cash flow, which is basically how much money is left over for here you can see investing and then there's financing, which there should be another thing here. I don't know why it isn't there, but oh, sorry, cash from financing is there and then cash from investing is there. So you wanna know how much money is left over to invest. And if free cash flow is negative, it's usually a bad sign because it means that they're not actually making money from their, they're not making cash flow from their operations and they might actually be getting, they might actually be maintaining positive cash through financing. They might be taking on more debt, which is definitely not a good sign. But free cash flow isn't actually in the statement, but QuickFS calculates it for us if we go over to quick ratios um, and we come down here, free cash flow. So we can see that free cash flow has been pretty steady, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, especially over these last few years, it's actually been going up quite a lot. So that's quite good. Um, so I'm actually going to be entering in these these numbers because I think they don't, they don't look too bad and I think it'd be worthwhile to enter them in. All right, so I've done almost all of it. Unfortunately, that for some reason, they don't have the 2008 um, free cash flow, so we'll just calculate it ourselves using the calculator. So this is exactly, I'll show you exactly how we do it. Cash from operations, negative 179, and we're gonna subtract property, plant, and equipment. So 6696, so we get negative 6875. Negative 6875. Okay, so that's all of those entered in. And after we've done that, we can come over to the growth table and we can see uh, what their growth has been like. And of course, these are for, we, we can't calculate growth from negative numbers, so that's why they're, they're negative. And actually, it's best if you go through and zero these out because sometimes it, um, it messes up if you don't put these as zeros. It gives you growth rates that shouldn't be there. Cool, all right. So as we can see, sales growth, been slow nine years it's been almost zero actually yeah it's been just very slow although it has been improving so that is a good sign earnings per share growth very slow over the long term improving again um, equity growth improving which is good free cash flow was slowed down this year but it had been improving so it's actually not horrible I've seen worse but that sales growth being very slow means that a lot of their earnings growth, if we're going to be expecting them to be able to grow their earnings, 
it's going to be coming from reducing costs and that sort of thing rather than them generating new customers and that um, from that aspect. I actually just noticed that this video has already been going for over 10 minutes so um, I might just leave it there for now and I'm just going to go through slowly each of these. It, let, let me know down in the comments section below if you want me to go this slow or do you want me to cut out a lot of, a lot of the crap and um, sort of just make it more concise because obviously when I make my other videos they're I can get a lot of information in because they're very concise. So let me know if you want to see the entire process like I've just shown here and you want me to just go through the list and just go through what I'm thinking at the time as I'm um, analyzing these stocks or if you want me to sort of speed it up a little bit more. And I can sort of meet in the middle, I guess, where I can prepare, I can have all of the numbers written in prepared and know which ones um, I'm actually going to be keeping before I start the video. So just let me know what you want from these videos so that I can keep them uh, not too long. I don't want to waste too much of your time. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this one, guys. And I'm keen to go through and look at some of these other stocks. And hopefully we will find one that is an absolute gem that we can add to our portfolio. So if you enjoy this kind of video, make sure you hit subscribe and stick around so you see all of the rest of the episodes for this series. Uh, check out the other episodes if you haven't seen. And if you haven't seen that Apple stock analysis that I posted earlier this week, I recommend you go check it out. I put a lot of, a lot of effort into that video uh, and I think it was quite, it'll be quite useful, especially if you're interested in looking into Apple. So uh, that's all for today, guys. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.